Now, how did you find the story, the backstory of how it was that John requested you? Okay. The story that I got, and I still don't even, can't even tell you really what happened, was uh, the, the day that I met John for the, what I think was the first time. He thinks it was 1975. I think it was in 1980. Uh, I got to the studio quite early, not that I was excited, but it was the first day, and I got there a couple hours early. He was there by himself in the studio at Hit Factory. And I went out, introduced myself, and he says, nice to see you again. I said, really? Have we met? <laughs> and he says, do you remember that record that David Bowie did? And we would, I said, yeah, I played on the record, and yeah, we did fame, and we did this, and... And I'm just kind of looking at him, and he's looking at me, and I said, you know, I think I would remember this. <laughs> <That> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so I think I might be right. I don't know. Um, for some reason, John knew of me, obviously, and, and decided that I was one of the right musicians for the album. And so, well, that was, uh, apart from the fact that he remembered you more than the other way around, which I think is lovely. That's, I mean, that's, that's uh, Really I was fun. somewhere between embarrassed and baffled. <laughs> I couldn't figure out which one I was at the time. No, I, I mean, like... I've just gone and said hello to John Lennon and tell him I don't remember him. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, we haven't even started the record yet. What a, that's a good start, right? <laughs> now, it was, tell us a little about those experiences because you spent quite a lot of time and it hadn't been, when you started recording, it had not yet been announced that John was going back in the studio. Oh no, we had to be quiet. We were like sworn to secrecy on that one. Weren't you desperate to phone up friends and say, hey, guess oh, who I'm working when, with? When they called me, when I got the call about the record, I was told to, in no uncertain terms, to, to just button it up. And that was not easy. And I did what I was told, you know, you don't want to compromise opening your big mouth and getting kicked off a John Lennon record. That's, wouldn't, that's not cool. Um, and even when we first went in the studio, it was pretty quiet for the first week, and then the press announcements came out, and every, you know, we, we could talk about it. And at that point, I bet some of your friends were pretty uh, very keen to hear about this. This must have been so exciting. Everybody was. The thing was, you know what? I didn't see a lot of my friends at that time because we were so busy. We were recording five or six days a week. Um, and um, we were pretty sequestered in there. It wasn't like a big party. We were, you know, it was John and the band and the producer and, and staff, but that was it. Uh, but, you know, every time you went out at night, which I did every single night, me and Lee DiCarlo, the engineer, became, uh, we were sampling different pubs in New York for the course of the album. Uh, you know, you'd run into people, and you'd get all the, how's it going in the studio? What's John's new stuff like? And, you know, when is it coming out? And how is he? And all this kind of stuff. Um, uh, tell me how you found uh, John and Yoko in the studio. What was the, what was the vibe? I mean, would John come in and play something on an acoustic and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking? Or uh, would they play back demos? What was the, before you started recording each track? They had... Um, I guess what you'd call a musical director in there named Tony Davilio. He, was, he, he played keyboards as well. And he had written charts out. I couldn't even read a chord chart. I mean, the ones with the little dots. You need and to stuff. fake it. You need to fake it one. Right, exactly. So um, everybody had the charts in front of them, and I'm going, okay, I'm in deep stuff. Four letters S, T, no, that's five letter word. Uh, and which John found quite amusing because. He had no clue either. So what, what, for the most part, what would happen is, is John would just get in this little tiny vocal guitar on the microphone, and he would play the song. Or he'd sit at the piano and do it. And, and that, that's how I, because I, I, I do everything by ear. Um, and then during the course of playing the songs, everybody had their sheet music, but one thing I was always good at, if I hear it once or twice, I can play it. So, and I would watch John, because I was always in the, in the, right in the line of sight with him all the time. Um, and it was very easygoing situation in there, um, and that's how it was done for the most part. There weren't really demos, like now everybody goes in and makes demos that God, before would be considered albums. You know, people spend months and thousands of dollars making demos, you know, where it was just, hey, this is my new song. And he would play straight through it and goes, you guys got any ideas? Slicky, what do you got? 
He said, I, he says, I need a part for this. I go, cool. He goes, great. All right, do that one. And, and you know, that's how we did it. Were you slicky to him? Yeah. Slicky. You must have enjoyed that as a, a nickname. DB started that one. David started that one. It was Slicky or Slick. It was one or the other with him. That's what he called me. And um, would, when you would hear the songs, I mean, was there sometimes, it was, obviously it was just coming innately from what you felt was there. Would there sometimes be a discussion about a particular sound or a particular guitar sound or, you know, we need something a little bit more edge or a bit more this or a bit more that? Or was it just unspoken? Um, the basic track part of it was pretty much unspoken, um, except for <laughs> cleanup time. I didn't know, that solo on there that I did, that's live, that's on the basic track, that's not overdubbed. He gave me a look, didn't say anything on the mic, and just looked at me, and I knew what he wanted, and I played the solo live, and it's the one we kept, it's the first take. Um... Some of the other things on the record, we used some Beatle tricks on sounds. Uh, uh, on I'm Losing You, um, what he did was, is we played through what was going to be the solo section in the studio. And I came up with the licks, and Huey came up with some licks. And um, once we assembled it, and we go, wow, that's the one, me and Huey plugged through two very small amplifiers with a stereo microphone in between it, and we tracked it eight times. And it, I don't know if any a technical term is, uh, when you compress something, it, it creates this, it creates a, a, a specific sound. And he told me that's how they recorded the guitars on Nowhere Man. Um, and it, there was things that he was bringing like that where he wanted something specific sound-wise. I learned a lot from him from that stuff. Not to mention is what people don't realize that John Lennon was one of the best guitar players I've ever played with in my life. The feel that came out of his fingers, because you listen to the records and you hear what you hear, but when you're standing in a room with him and, and you're watching and you're feeling and hearing, you're going, oh my God, he's, he's amazing. And we're not talking about Fancy lick playing. We're talking about actual real guitar playing. He was a great guitar player. In those, um, that time, I, and the songs that we're recording, um, was there a, uh, were you conscious of John having worked out what he wanted to be on the Double Fancy album and what was being recorded for Milk and Honey? Or was it just simply, at that point, you were just recording the songs? It was just one continuous con uh, recording session. The first thing we recorded was just like starting over. Uh, one of the, and I think the second thing we did was... Um, nobody told me, which ended up on Milk and Honey. Uh, so we just recorded all these songs, and then he assembled what turned into Double Fantasy and mastered and put it out. The rest of the material was going to be addressed in... January of 1981, and obviously it didn't get addressed. So what you hear on that is the fact that we did play live like a band. So there, those vocals on there were not over. Those are live vocals of us just playing the songs. Now, Earl, um, we are a little constrained by time, but tomorrow you'll be back on the stage. And tomorrow, uh, in conversation, I know you'll talk about your work with George and Ringo on the Carl Perkins sessions. But as we look back on that momentous time, um, the shock and pain of what you, that news you heard. Had there been, even before then, had there been talk about playing live? Had that been discussed at all? Yeah. Um, I was living in Los Angeles at the time we did that record. And um, the day before I left, um, John came over, he says, by the way, um, I'll see you around Christmas time. And then, in January, he said, we want to go back and we're going to finish the rest of these tracks. It wasn't called Milk and Honey. It wasn't called anything yet. Uh, but he said, we want to finish those. We're going to do a tour. And I said, well, I got to get back and make a record and, the, and Columbia is going to want me to tour. He says, well, I want you to tour with me. I said, how do we do this? He says, I call Columbia Records and I told him I want you to tour with me. 